thanks everybody for joining us today for this joint broadcast from the American Geophysical Union and our partner, AGI. Uh, this is, uh, been a, it's, you're going to you have a, a great presentation to come. I'm going to turn it over to Phil, who's going to make our introduction. Hi, thanks everybody. And uh, I want to thank Dave Harwell with AGU for um, setting this up. And uh, this is the first uh, global environmental change webinar, uh, part of the centennial celebration for AGU. Join us on May 21st for Climate Extremes in Present and Future, presented by Sonia Senovaratne. Um, I want to uh, briefly introduce our speaker today. Uh, Jonathan Overpeck, or Peck as he's known, is the Samuel A. Graham Dean of the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. He was elected an AGU Fellow in 2015, uh, and he's also been awarded the U.S. Department of Commerce Gold and Bronze Me Medals, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Walter Orr Roberts Award of the American Meteorological Society. Before joining the University of Michigan in 2017 as, as the dean, he was director of the Institute of the Environment at University of Arizona. His research is broadly focused on past, present, and future climate and on scientific engagement with society through climate applications. He co-led regional climate science centers for both the Department of Interior and NOAA, the latter known as the Climate Assessment for the Southwest, or CLEMAS. Uh, he holds a PhD from Brown. And I'd like to turn it over now to Peck. Thank you, Phil. It's great to be able to join everybody here today to talk about drought and water security in the West, uh, particularly the Southwest. But I think uh, part of the message here, uh, hopefully you all take home, is that this is a problem not just in the Southwest and the West of uh, North America, but around the planet. And it's a good thing to understand in part because um, global warming is one of those things that uh, we can clearly see occurring and we can see the impacts and it's something we can control. There are other things uh, that are important to understand when it comes to water and landscape security. And when I say landscape security, I just mean thing, worrying about issues like wildfire, uh, forest mortality, and ecosystem change. And again, it's just like impacts on uh, water, uh, we're starting to see the climatic impacts on landscapes as well. I'll also touch um, very centrally on drought, uh, mega drought, which uh, today is just uh, defined as an unusually long drought, and then southwest something 20 years or longer. Other places in the world may be longer or shorter to be a mega drought. And I'll be talking about aridification. Um, to let the cat out of the bag, what we're seeing in many parts of the world now is not just drought. Of course, we all, uh, particularly stakeholders, decision makers, politicians are thinking it's a drought. And like all droughts in the past, the drought will end. Uh, unfortunately, with warming playing a larger and larger role, it is uh, becoming more of an aridification problem. That is a drought that won't end. Um, unless we have unusually wet periods to punctuate the increasingly dry periods as we go forward with global warming. I'll focus mostly on the Southwest, but I will try to touch on the global implications at the end. This is not the place. Uh, I think everyone probably uh, is well aware uh, that global warming is occurring. I just want to highlight, though, that uh, the planet has warmed over degree C uh, since pre-industrial times. The five warmest years on record all occurred in the last five years, so it's pretty unequivocal. Um, well, let's just say it's very unequivocal. <laughs> but one of the things I like to show in this plot from NASA showing the trend in uh, global temperatures uh, over the period 1880 to uh, 2018, we have colors wherever there were thermometers over that span, is that the warming tends to be greater over land than over the ocean. There are a variety of reasons for that, but the most important thing to realize right now is that when someone says, well, the planet will warm a degree, it has to warm a degree, or it'll warm uh, three or four degrees by such and such a date, uh, that means uh, warmer temperatures over land, where most people live, obviously, and um, in some cases, much greater warming if you're at higher latitudes. But today, we're here to talk about water, which to me is really the sharp edge of climate change 
uh, in the United States, and particularly the Southwest. You could argue in the United States on our coasts, it's too much water, or say in the uh, high plains, the Midwest, what we're having right now is too much water. Um, that's all connected with climate change as well. Uh, but what we're talking about today and focusing on today is not enough water. <laughs> so in some places there's too much, in some places there'll be too little. But the issue of um, essentially hot drought or climate change uh, exacerbated drought is a, is a global problem, even in places that are getting wetter. If we care to talk about that in Q&A, we can do that. Uh, something remarkable has happened in the West this year. Anyone who's been out West or paying attention is probably very uh, happy and smiling. We had a phenomenal snow year across much of this, uh, the West, and particularly the Southwest. You can see here on the uh, left a uh, map of the drought status. This is the drought, U.S. Drought Monitor. Um, in late January, we had really a pretty serious looking drought spanning much of the Southwest with a big bullseye in the Four Corners area in the Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico. And lo and behold, now, uh, several months later, you still see some uh, lingering bullseye effects in New Mexico in the Four Corners area, but drought has really uh, been wiped from the map, or so we think. If you look at the uh, course of drought over the uh, last 100 plus years, we're actually in the drought of record, meaning the worst drought that we've seen since we had rain gauges and we're keeping track. And this drought started in 1999 and has gone through to this year. And we'll come back to why I'm saying that. It's not just a little bullseye in the Four Corners area remaining. Um, but here, just to look back over this drought, are snapshots of some of the interesting and particularly bad years that we've had um, in the summers when you really feel the full effects of the drought. In 2002, 2004, in that interval, we had drought down into Mexico, up into Canada. It was really starting to get noticeable. Um, 2012 was interesting because the drought moved out on the high plains, looked more Dust Bowl-like. Um, 2013, it really was uh, centered on New Mexico and the panhandle of Texas, and you can see uh, the other parts of the region. These colors, the darkest, are, are really exceptional drought. Um, and the drought has essentially moved around, and I like to think of it as this, the Southwest New Millennium Drought, um, because the region has always been in drought, one place or another, since 1999. And uh, the one state that probably has had it the worst is Arizona, my old home state where I lived for almost 20 years until recently. So I was really paying attention to this. But I'd like to maintain today, and I do this wherever anyone will listen, that the drought isn't over. And uh, part of the reason I say that is there are multiple ways to define drought. You can have a meteorological drought, um, define about you know period when it's not raining. And clearly, we are not in a meteorological drought now in the southwest because we've had bucket loads of snow way above normal. And uh, an agricultural drought, um, sort of the integrated longer-term effects of drought, I think in the southwest, again, uh, the water supplies are plenty good for farming this year. So we're not really in an agricultural drought, but we're in a hydrologic drought. And we're in a ecological drought, meaning... In this case, as you can see here, uh, even as late as this last month, April, people are talking about droughts. So they're not just talking. Congress is passing bills and the President of the United States is signing bills to um, put into effect water sharing uh, agreements, curtailments of water use, because the largest reservoirs in the United States on the Colorado River, Lake Mead and Powell, are less than half full and are getting dangerously close to a official shortage where water uh, curtailments will be even larger. So a lot of people are, uh, who work on making sure that water supplies are secure are pretty concerned, even with the good snowpack that we had this last winter. Everybody's hoping for more good snowpack in years to come, but it's more prudent to realize that with climate change, that's less and less likely as we go forward. 
Let's take a closer look at the Colorado River. It's the lifeblood of the Southwest, and you can see on this map um, the seven states that are the basin states, the Colorado River Basin. There's a lower basin and an upper basin that's marked, but it spans all the way from Wyoming down to Arizona and California. You can also see the many U.S. cities in red that share the water from the Colorado River. And in total, depending on how you count it, somewhere between 30 and 50 million people are using the water from the Colorado River in the United States. And the water is also allocated um, a fair share to Mexico. So uh, a lot of Mexican agricultural production and municipal use um, is, of this river is also going on down there. So this is, a, this is the lifeblood. Um, you can also see that um, just by looking at this map, if you know about uh, indigenous culture in the United States, you know there are a lot of tribes in this region sharing this water supply. You know if you're eating uh, vegetables in winter, that those are often from Southern California or uh, Arizona, and those are watered with Colorado River water. Um, this is now, once again, the fastest growing part of the country. People are moving here in droves, and yet the water supply continues to dwindle, not just in the Colorado, but also in the Rio Grande off in New Mexico. Um, that's another lifeblood river uh, with headwaters shared with the uh, Colorado, but much, many of the smaller rivers. When we don't get good snowpack or when that snowpack disappears more quickly because of warming, lo and behold, there's less water running in the rivers and the water supply is less secure. Just to take a peek at these two um, reservoirs, Powell and Me, they're the two largest reservoirs in the country. You can see them there pointed out on the map. Right now, or yesterday anyhow, um, Powell was 34, 37, uh, 39% full, and Meade was 41% full. We hope that the big snowpack will, of course, bring the levels of these reservoirs up. But there's another thing going on, of course, and that is the water is heavily allocated, and uh, many of us would argue over-allocated, so it makes it harder um, to fill up reservoirs when we get these really nice winter uh, snowfall um, seasons. And instead, we still will probably deplete it as we head into the next year, meaning that the drought isn't gone now and it won't be next year. Well, let's take a closer look at the, the longer term patterns of change in the Colorado River. And this work is work uh, that Brad Udall led with me um, and it was published in Water uh, Resources, um, uh, peer-reviewed journal, um, Water Resources, uh, Resources Research, yes, sorry. Um, and um, what we're looking at uh, on the top graph is the combined storage in Lake Powell and Mead um, for the period uh, 1910 up to 2014. Um, that's the data that we had available when we published this paper. And you can see that um, Lake uh, Mead formed in the 1930s when we built Boulder Dam, which became known as Hoover Dam, and then again became known as Boulder Dam again later on. Uh, but that allowed me to fill up. And then we had the drought in the 1950s and 60s. That was the drought of record until the current drought. And then everybody was a little worried that we wouldn't have enough water. And there was a, a big um, debate about whether we should build more reservoirs in the Grand Canyon itself. Originally, that wasn't um, that didn't become reality. Instead, we built the Glen Canyon Dam, which at the top of the Grand Canyon. Um, with Lake Powell behind it. And you can see the combined storage filled up then until the 1980s um, because we had water in both Powell and Mead. Small drought in the uh, late 80s and 90s, full uh, almost to the brim, and actually almost overflowed in the 1980s. Um, and that was a, a big event during an El Nino. Uh, but it was full in the 1990s, at the end of the 1990s, when I moved to the south, uh, to Tucson from Colorado. Um, it was lapping full in the 
most of the water managers of the Southwest were pretty darn happy, not worried about drought. I came to, uh, I can remember going to a, a meeting in Vegas with a lot of water managers talking about drought. And some of them um, kind of laughed at me. But a year later, we were in drought. And there was plummeting water uh, levels in the rivers uh, and in the lakes, in the reservoirs. And you can see that plummeting now. Well, now let's look at the causes of this. This is the, the new millennium drought, we've called it. Um, I'm sure it has other names. And you can see in the lower graph here, uh, natural flows, meaning uh, if you take out the effects of all the reservoirs and all the diversions and everything else that goes on in this great river now, you can actually get reconstructed natural flows. And you can see three lines here, a squiggly white line, a gray line, that's the year-to-year -year flow levels. Then you can see a blue line, and that gives you, it's a slower varying line that gives you the lower frequency variations or the, the slow varying variations in the river flow. Um, and the dotted red line, or the dashed red line, and that's the long-term linear trend in um, flow. And you can see that there's a lot of variability from year to year. So getting a really good snow year like this year isn't that unusual. Um, and fortunately for us, it happens. And that really helps get through droughts in the past. And you can see during the 1950s and 60s drought, the blue line, um, there were some good years, but overall there were more bad years, so the, the flow went down on average, and that was um, really the worst drought we had in the Southwest until we hit the current drought, where um, the flow levels were even lower than they were during the 50s and 60s. And you can see in the dashed red line that there's been a linear trend here um, from the very beginning to present of less and less water flowing in the Colorado River. Now, here's the same graph. The two top ones are the same ones we just looked at. And down below, we're looking at how precipitation has varied over this time period in the upper basin of the Colorado, that is the headwaters, where all the water comes from, and how temperature is varied over that same interval of time. And notice I'm using English units here, including million acre feet for the amount of water in the river. These are the units the water managers are used to. So when we did this work, we have in the paper, uh, we also have uh, metric units in case anyone wants to look at those. But we really are talking as much to managers as to other scientists. Um, and check out the uh, precipitation record over the last 100 plus years. Again, it's the same deal. We see the ups and downs in precipitation. You see some really good years and some bad years. On average, during the 50s, 60s drought, less precipitation. And you can see that in the, the dipping blue line as we go through that period of time. And interestingly enough, during the current drought, uh, you don't see a big deficit in precipitation. You certainly see it in the early 2002 to four years, and you see another really bad year um, more recently. But on average, the precipitation hasn't been the cause of this drought, something else. And if you look at temperature, you can see that temperature was about normal during the 50s, 60s drought, but it was really high during the current drought. And if you look at the trends in these two uh, graphs or time series, you can see precipitation, the dotted red or dashed red line is pretty flat over the entire period. In other words, there hasn't been a long-term increase or decrease in precipitation, all the while the natural flow has been going down, down, down. And interesting enough, temperature is the mirror image of the natural flow. So as temperature has gone up, the flow has gone down, and precipitation has more or less stayed the same when you're looking at the trends over the last 100 years. And that is the big story here, is that we often, I think scientists and, and uh, manager alike, we often think of a drought as a period without snowfall or rainfall, the precipitation deficit, when in reality we're getting a whole new kind of drought now, a temperature-driven drought. And it can, of course, combine with precipitation uh, deficits or excesses and uh, to yield a net amount of water in a river or in a forest. But what we've been seeing in the river is reductions in natural flow because we've been getting increases in temperature. All right. Here's that graph again that we were looking at earlier. And, of course, the culprit then behind the decreasing flows of the Colorado is the warming. And that warming is due to us. It's global warming. 
And that, of course, on one hand, oh, it's bad news. Water security is jeopardized by global warming. But remember, one of the good pieces of good news is we understand this well enough now to be confident that if we stop the global warming, then we'll stop the long-term aridification of the river. And of course, this is not just a Southwest story. This is a Westwide story. This is a global story. Now let's just take a quick look on where that water is going. Why is temperature taking water out of the Colorado River? And why, where is it going? Well, I'll tell you, it's going in the atmosphere. And the reason for this is because as the atmosphere warms, simple physics, it should hold more water. And we can see that in observations of atmospheric moisture content. And so a warming atmosphere is demanding more moisture than it did in the past. And over the oceans, there's plenty of water. It can load up from evaporation from the ocean. Over land, though, where does the water come from? And it turns out it comes from a whole lot of places that would normally go in the river. So the most obvious one is evaporation from surface water, you know, even in these large reservoirs, we're losing over a million acre feet a year just to evaporation. As it gets warmer, that gets bigger, more water gets evaporated. But we're also seeing other things. The biggest effect, it turns out, is that um, water is being transported by plants from soil into the atmosphere in a process known as evapotranspiration. And it's much like evaporation. The only difference is the water is going uh, through the soil and in, through the plants into the atmosphere. And because of the warming, you're not only getting more evapotranspiration, you're also getting a longer growing season. And that longer growing season more means more plants are, are greening up, transporting water into the atmosphere in the early spring, late winter, and in the late fall, early uh, winter. There are these other factors that I mentioned on this slide, you know, sublimation from snow. That means because it's warmer, more snow is actually uh, converting to water vapor in the atmosphere than in the past directly. Um, when you have more rain, on the, you don't have as much snow, so you don't, uh, you're, you have, you're more vulnerable to losing that water to the atmosphere. Um, rain also is melting the snow that exists. And there's also some other factors and positive feedbacks. We call them amplifying factors. So what we're looking at here is the challenge of hot drought. A bunch of years I wrote about this um, and just was thinking about it in a, a more of a perspective piece. Um, and the point being that one of the big things we have to worry about with climate change is the very nature of drought gets a lot worse because of the warming. And uh, not only does the nature get worse, but we also start, we'll start to see, and we are starting to see, the uh, changes in drought statistics. If you think about it, because it's warmer now, we're more likely to get a drought. Uh, those droughts are more likely to last longer um, and um, to be more frequent. So the big question I have for all of you, AGU wanted to uh, throw in a poll or two so normally I ask at this point, are we in a drought? So are we in a mega drought? In the southwest, we just now drought last on your time. screen. And uh, please select an answer. Your options are yes, no, and not sure. So it looks like about a third of you have voted so far. We'll give you a few more moments to, to answer the question about whether we're really in a drought and almost in a mega drought. And I'll count down, five, four, three, two, and one. So the poll is now closed. And the answer is? And the answer is 66% said yes, 11% said no, and 23% Said not sure. So those are good answers. And I gave away the answer really beforehand. We are in a drought. It's a hot drought. Um, and to many people, droughts end. And so one of the biggest ahas that we're trying to convey, and I think a lot of water managers are getting it now, not necessarily politicians, is that this drought might not end. It might be a drought 
but it's also a long-term aridification because as long as the warming, warming continues, we're going to get a continuation, all things equal, of less and less flow in the southwest rivers. All right. Move on here. The big question then is what's ahead for the river and how well do we know? Um, about, you know, I'd say six or seven years ago, the state of the art, many people were starting to recognize that with global warming, we had an increased chance of less flow in the river. And the papers, there are multiple papers, um, with estimates of how the flow would change in the future, they range from minus uh, like 1% decrease, so a 1% decrease to a 45% decrease by mid-century. Interesting enough, most, I don't know, all papers um, that were written and published in the peer review literature said continue climate change, we'll have less water in the river. Most of them were focused on the precipitation side of things. We got all those folks together, most of them anyhow, at least one person from each of those papers, and we had, with support from uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, we tried to reconcile all the, this wide range of estimates to get what would be the best estimate uh, for change if we, if we allowed climate change to continue, if we allowed global warming to continue. And we came up with a estimate in a paper uh, lead authored by Julie Vano in BAMS, the Bolton American Meteorological Society, that if uh, the warming continues, uh, we'll get a 6.5% uh, uh, decrease in river flow for every degree warming, plus or minus 3.5%, meaning somewhere between 3 and 10% of the river flow will decrease for every degree of warming. And we've had about um, had over a degree C warming in the basin so far, and we've had about a 19% decrease in flow. So it appears that a good portion, portion of the flow reduction that we've seen is likely due to this warming. But we can then use that estimate based on a wide variety of uh, analyses to get an idea how much flow reduction we could have by the end of the century more than 50% of the flow in the Colorado, but other rivers as well, could be lost just due to the warming, if we allow the warming to continue as it is now continuing, business as usual, all right? So this is a big number, and if you look at the full range, it's up to 70 or 80% reduction is possible. But Brad and I, after looking at all the data in our paper, which followed on the Vano et al. paper, Brad Udall, that is, we concluded that it's probably somewhere between 35 and 50 percent by the end of the century, noting that we've probably lost, of the 19 percent flow reduction we've had so far, probably around half of that is due to the warming. Some of our colleagues, and certainly some uh, stakeholders as well, have said, well, so what's the big deal? Okay, yeah, temperature will go up, but maybe we'll get more precipitation. And indeed, some of the climate models that we use to project into the future indicate there will be more precipitation in the basin. Other models suggest less, and most of the models suggest not a change. And we have a lot more confidence in the temperature going up. I mean, it's pretty much you can bet your house that as long as we put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we're going to get more warming. But when it comes to precipitation, which model do you believe? So let's go to a poll. This will only, I'll only do two of these, so this is the second one. Can we rely on greater precipitation to save the day for the Colorado and other southwest rivers and offset the flow reductions due to temperature warming? Okay, so please select one of the options that's on the screen now. I'll give you a few more moments. Uh, to make a selection before we close the poll. And the poll will close in five, four, three, two, one. And the results are that 6% uh, said yes, 82%, the majority said no, and 12 said not sure. 
People are listening carefully. I love it. I've never done these polls before. It's fun. Um, yeah, we already looked at the precipitation record, you know, and I like our climate models. I know these climate models are reliable for some things, certainly for temperature, but even how much warming we'll get depends on a number of factors. So we get different estimates from different models. They all say it'll continue to warm. Well, when it comes to precipitation, some models say more, some say less. But there has been no increase. Mother Nature says there hasn't been any increase, and it's been warming dramatically over the last 100 years. No change in precipitation long-term trend. So the bottom line is don't bet on more precipitation. Now, I'll throw in a caveat. Some of my colleagues believe that there is, in, um, you know, well, we all believe <laughs> that there's internal variability in precipitation on, on long time scales. These give you the natural droughts and the natural wet periods. Well, a lot, there is a subset of my colleagues who think, well, it's going to start to get wet again soon. Uh, but there is no sign of it in Mother Nature, and the bulk of the models say not likely. But some models suggest it will. But I would like to maintain, and I won't throw another poll at you, but uh, it doesn't even matter. If mean or average precipitation goes up in the future, um, we'll still have a major threat to our water security because of the warming. Why is that? Think for a minute. What else could happen that can, can, could negate the effect of an increase in average precipitation? Well, some bet a lot of you have been thinking, what about drought? <laughs> if we get into a precipitation drought, meaning a period with below normal precipitation, and maybe that even lasts, longer than 20 years in the Southwest, we call that a mega drought. Uh, then the full effect of the temperature would be affected, uh, would be felt with no offset from a higher average precipitation because we're not during a drought getting more than average precipitation, right? So this is a problem around the globe. In the Southwest, we wrote a paper led by Toby Alt, who's now a professor at Cornell, and in that, we used both models and data to try and get a, the best estimate of what's the, what are the odds of a, a long drought, a mega drought, in the Southwest in the last 50 years of this century. And we came up with the odds of a 25-year long mega drought of 17%, the odds of a 50-year long mega drought, 8%. The odds of these droughts go up as we warm. But if you combine both of these factors then, the temperature effect on the left, the one we already saw, 50% or more flow reduction because of the warming, with the effect of a drought, and believe me, I think everyone on, the, on this webinar probably knows the Southwest has had mega droughts in the past. You've seen all of the ancient uh, Pueblo dwellings um, that often reflect people's migration away from the Southwest because we think not enough water. Um, in any case, uh, the best estimates based on tree ring data suggest that we could have as much as 15% less flow in the rivers in the Colorado do, uh, during a drought. So you combine those two things and you get a really bad looking situation where there's just not a lot of water, at least during the periods of the mega drought. And some of these mega droughts, what's the longest one in the last 2,000 years? Turns out, based on tree ring data, 50 years with only one year of above normal precipitation. That's a paper in Geophysical Research Letters led by Cody Reutzen, who's now at Northern Arizona University. And again, this is a global problem. And here, what we've shown in one of our projects is a map just showing where, in colors, where you have projected um, increase in drought risk or increase, you know, drought risk around the planet. You can see the Southwest is a particularly drought-prone region. Um, Australia, parts of Africa, the Mediterranean is really a bad spot. But there are many parts of the world that have had mega droughts. And you can see in Amazon, a mega drought is shorter, but we've only seen a drought about one year in the Amazon so far. But in the paleoclimatic record, work led by Luke Parsons, um, who's now at the University of Washington, um, we've seen droughts that last over a decade in the Amazon. 
In Australia, uh, our colleagues have found um, in work led by Cam Barr and others, droughts that last over 100 years. He's at the University of Adelaide. And so around the planet, um, there have been uh, these mega droughts. So as the planet warms up, the risk of hot drought goes up and the risk, serious risk to water security goes up because during those droughts, we'll feel the full effect of that hot drought. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude with a picture of Lake Michigan. So in case anyone that is listening from out west wants to know where the water is going to be in the future, uh, you can see a nice picture. Um, and I, I'm open to questions or whatever else is next on this great adventure. Thanks. Well, thanks, Beth, uh, for a great presentation. We do have some questions coming in uh, to the question panel. If you have a question, go ahead and enter it now. And we'll start out with our first question that's just coming in from Johan. Uh, how can we as scientists better communicate the uncertainty of, of, future, of the future and what it means to the public? Yeah, you know, I think someone's got to move. Mute. I think that's a great question because um, you can almost see it in, you know, I've got some gray hair, as you can see, um, and I've been communicating on climate for uh, a long time. You know, I've been in this business for nearly 40 years. And when we really started to communicate, um, I think it, it all started when I was back at NASA GIS and Jim Hansen testified before Congress in 1988. You know, that's really when climate change communication kicked off in a big way. And Steve Schneider was another really big player early on. And, and he taught me uh, that it really pays to try and explain how, we, how well we know what we know not in a global sense, but in a particular sense. In other words, if we're talking about temperature, we have um, multiple ways of knowing that as you put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it has to warm. We know from physics, we know from observations, we can see it occurring, um, we know from our com computer models. Uh, then we want to sort of get more nuanced about how the um, warming will play out in the future, all the computer models, all the theory, everything we've got suggests that it will continue to warm as long as we put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So I usually will now say, um, and again, I think when you're talking to the public, um, you don't want to get into scientific jargon and things. You just want to be crystal clear. If we keep putting greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, you can bet your house that over the next coming decades, it will warm. And it will warm a lot if we put a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and it will warm less if we put less. And, and then if they want quantification of that, of course, then we can turn to our scientific literature, which is rich, and provide them with estimates of, say, uh, well, in the Southwest, the range of models suggests that for business as usual emissions, by the end of the century, it'll be somewhere between 4 and 7 degrees C. Most of the models are in that mid-range. Um, between those two numbers. Okay? So we can, we can get pretty specific. Contrast that with precipitation in the Southwest. The, the observations say there hasn't been a big change. Um, there's still a good amount of debate with the community. How good are those observations? You know, we don't have enough rain gauges and we have a mountainous terrain. There's also a big uh, sort of range in the model projections. Some models say there should be a noticeable change by now, increase or decrease. Well, there hasn't been. And then if you look out towards the end of the century, the model projections range from big increases in the upper basin of the Colorado to decreases in the upper basin of the Colorado. Most models saying there isn't. So contrast that with my temperature. I wouldn't bet anything on a precipitation projection for the Southwest US. And I think that if, when you're in that situation as a climate scientist, you tend to um, retreat to what's normal. What have we seen in the past as being your best estimate of what could happen in the future? And that's why I like to say that uh, water security is, is really challenged in the future because we know the temperatures go up and we don't have any way of having faith in precipitation uh, counterbalancing that. And of course, then we have the drought problem. <laughs> I hope that gives you a little sense. Does thanks. We're going to go to Julia now, who's uh, monitoring questions on social media. So, Julia. 
Hello there. Um, so we just have a few more questions. Um, okay, so one webinar participant wants to know how um, can the data that you have been presenting on be used to inform lawmakers and help facilitate drought legislation? That's a hard question. Um, there are many ways and no one has figured it out yet. It's like there's a magic elixir that um, is sitting in a cave somewhere and we have to find it. Uh, I have my own thoughts on this. Um, there's a rich and growing um, literature on science communication, climate communication. Um, my own feeling is that uh, if we're talking to people who already believe in climate change, pay attention to science, have a scientific understanding, and there are many of them in Congress, in the state houses, and other uh, political leaders, then you can, um, you can be very forthright and just give it to them as it is in the scientific literature or say an IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment. You know, it's a consensus of hundreds, thousands of scientists, and, and that's pretty compelling for them. But then on the other side of the aisle, let's say, there are a number who are just darn skeptical, and they're skeptical for reasons that are uh, legitimate, they don't, they don't understand the science, um, or they're just politically um, aligned against understanding the science, or outright trying to deny the science. And there it gets a lot trickier. Um, and to talk to their tribe, <laughs> uh, meaning people like them, um, I think the most effective way forward, there are multiple ways, and you can read about them in the literature, but for me it all comes down um, to building relationships. And um, one of the strengths of being a scientist is there are many of us, um, and I think many of us ha live in local contexts, uh, universities and government labs and such, and we need to get out and start building relationships, not just with the people that, you know, essentially think like we do about science, but about, with those people who are skeptical. Um, and some people, of course, a great study at Yale by uh, Tony Lacerowitz has shown that there's like 10% of Americans you'll never get through to because they're just politically or whatever worldview is just not going to accept it. But I think most of the other Americans um, are open to having a discussion where you respect their worldview, respect where they're coming from, um, and you uh, respect how they, their way of knowing. And you have thoughtful conversations over a period of time. And in places where I've done this, um, it seems to work pretty well. You know, we find out that we're, uh, climate scientists don't have horns, and we uh, often share a lot of uh, observations and experiences that can uh, allow us to find common ground. Great. So we have a question that came in from James. He wants to know what's the balance between the increased prediction uh, precipitation predicted in the optimistic models for increased precip precipitation and the increased demand. You say the beginning of that again? So what is the balance between the increased precipitation predicted in the optimistic model and the increased demand? Okay. Um, I think in the Colorado Basin, there are a lot more people living, uh, moving there. Uh, than anywhere else in the country, and uh, there won't be more allocations of water. You know, the water flow is going down. And if there is a, you're, you're one of those folks who likes to go to Vegas and, you know, play the slots or maybe even bet more money on something else, maybe you're willing to bet on an increase in precipitation. So let's just do the thought experiment of getting a lot more precipitation. You're still going to have the problem of a mega drought hitting. Uh, very uh, good odds of a mega drought hitting in this century. So you're going to have a real, real problem. Um, they're not, I hope, I pray, that during any subsequent wet period that we get, and there could be a wet period that lasts 10 years, 15 years, not all that likely, but it could happen, they shouldn't be allocating any more water. The problem is, is the river is over-allocated. And it's probably over-allocated by about 20%. Um, for example, if you look at the long-term flows as reconstructed from tree rings, or even over the 20, you know, last 110 years with rain gauges, their average flows are lower by about 20% from the tree ring data and a little less in the shorter data um, than is allocated. And so um, 
there's a real problem there. And uh, part of that problem is called a structural deficit. Uh, when they built the Central Arizona project, bringing water to Phoenix and Tucson, um, they basically did that with mythical water that didn't exist. Um, and so the water, is, it's overallocated, and that's a problem across the West. The good news is that we don't need to use water nearly as uh, prolifically as we are now. Um, most of the water, about 70 to 75 percent of the water being used in the Southwest and around the world is agricultural. And so there are ways to cut back on that water use and still produce a lot of food and fiber that we need. Um, we just have to be more efficient about it. And the same thing holds true in cities and things like that. You go to Tucson, where I used to live, and there's not a lot of lawns, for example. Um, so a um, great book by uh, John Flack at the University of New Mexico, um, Waters for Fighting Over, I think is the title of it. <laughs> um, and he goes into great depths in that book about the many, the myriad ways that in the Southwest we could cut back our water use. And comes to a conclusion, I think, if I remember correctly, um, about uh, we, could, we could handle about a reduction in 30% of our water availability uh, through just more clever uses of water, uh, water reuse and things like that. So um, there's, there's still plenty of hope. Don't think there isn't hope. I think to me though, the big thing is, um, you know, we know the problem exists. We know why the problem exists of declining flows in our rivers, and we know how to stop it if we want. That's probably the most powerful piece of science that exists. Okay, back to social media with Julia. So Jonathan, you touched upon this a little bit, um, but one um, webinar attendee wants to know, how can technological advancements help guide the reversal of drought and desertification in the U.S.? Well, you know, the biggest technological advances that we're having right now, in my mind, are in the area of renewable energy the, uh, and um, electrifying the planet. So take renewable energy first. I mean, if you look at wind energy and solar energy, these are technologies. These are not commodities. So we're moving from a world that was driven by energy commodities, fossil fuels, coal, gas, and oil, into a world that is driven by energy technology. And everybody listening probably has um, looked at, you know, television evolution over their lives and seeing television getting so much better and screens getting so much bigger and the costs haven't been getting higher. In other words, technology, one of the beautiful things about it is the costs keep dropping. Another way to look at that is computing. You know, I have my iPhone right here and, you know, it's more powerful than the mainframe I used when I was a grad student. And think of how much this costs versus that mainframe at Brown University that probably costs millions of dollars. So um, what's happening with renewable energy, wind and particularly solar now, is but both, the costs are plummeting. And the other thing that's missing in our current uh, drive to a you know, renewable clean energy world is storage. And battery storage, another technology. So that's also the prices are plummeting. And they're not leveling off yet. I mean, with wind, they are starting to level off. So we're going to see continued reduction in the cost of battery storage and renewable energy for some time. And that's we're already at parity in some parts of the country with uh, fossil fuel. That's probably the most important, important technology. But there's a hell of a lot of other technology that we're going to need. A lot of greenhouse gas emissions come from agricultural production. And that isn't just a factor of, you know, whether we shift from beef to impossible food, you know, burgers. <laughs> um, it's also how intense our energy use is in producing food and fiber and how uh, we utilize our water. So there's going to be a lot of technological advancement there. There'll be everything in life, electrified cars and mobility and planes, using bioenergy for transcontinental or transocean flying. All of these things are going to involve technological advances. And I'll just leave you with a thought. Who is going to be selling to the global market that is demanding all of this technology? Is it going to be China or is it going to be the United States? Is it going to be both? Right now, China is producing, 
is moving much faster into electrified world than the United States. And sometimes I ponder, is that going to put them at a much bigger advantage in as the whole planet moves out of fossil fuels and into a renewable clean energy world? Okay, we have a question from George, and he's asking about uh, the reclamation supply and demand study of 2012. It, it predicted that the Colorado River flows would return to normal by 2019 and stay that way for the foreseeable future. It's, so why, why did they come up with those results? Uh, it, it seems to contrast with what you're, you're saying. Right. They weren't taking climate change into effect in a realistic way. And um, there have been a lot of Bureau of Reclamation work since then. Um, Bureau of Reclamation scientists were involved in the work that I described, the Vano et al. work, um, that came out um, five years later. Um, so uh, they're very good scientists, and they are taking climate into effect more and more as the scientific community starts to recognize that uh, climate change is the big driver of the flow reductions. And in that 2012, I think it was that study, you know, they also were, for the first time, they were utilizing uh, tree ring studies, uh, longer term flow, and doing some scenario assessment based on uh, the range of droughts that have occurred in the past. Um, and Connie Woodhouse at the University of Arizona, one of my colleagues there, was uh, played a big role in that work, and Dave Miko. And, um, another scientist in Arizona. And so the Bureau of Rec was just starting to recognize that the long-term flows are a lot less and that we actually, when we allocated the water in the Colorado, the beginning of the law of the river, the 1920s was, an un was the wettest time maybe in a thousand years. Um, a little joke played on by the gods or God um, on Southwesterners. Um, and so we over-allocated the water and we got a mistaken, um, sort of understanding of how the climate and the, the hydrology of the Southwest works. But, you know, I think the Bureau of Rec has really come around, um, as have uh, the whole scientific community. We know much more now. Thanks. Well, we, we have time for one. We might be able to get to two more questions. We'll see. Uh, this one's coming in from social media. Back to Julia. Well, this person wants to know whether you think that the rise in sustainable practices over the years have helped mitigate drought and water security issues. Well, for sure, um, they have helped. But I think the uh, use of sustainable practice or the deployment of sustainable practice has been quite small compared to what we need in the future to be able to deal with the growing water security problems. In other words, um, we there have been sort of things like um, Tucson and Las Vegas really learning how to shift from uh, west eastern style uh, landscapes and lawns to xeriscape, um, learning how to uh, reuse water, going from flood irrigation to drip irrigation, and drip irrigation has gotten much more sophisticated and, and, and more efficient through time learning how to deal with the soil uh, chemistry changes that come with using less water and that can make it difficult. Um, so there's a lot of sustainable practices that have already come into play at the municipal and sort of large scale uh, growing um, scale, you know, growing of agricultural scale. So um, the, I would say that we're just going to have to learn from the success in the past and deploy them much more uh, richly in the future and learn new sustainability practices um, that will, uh, if we all shift over to them, will allow us to live those same good lives we're living now and we'll just be able to get by with less water. Great. So I think we can sneak in one more question. And Faith has asked two questions. You, you started to talk about energy um, and uh, in in one of your previous responses, but uh, she's wondering if you could, if you could look at what's going to happen to energy. Where where are we likely to get our energy from? Will it be from nuclear? Will it be uh, from other sources? Are are is what we're seeing uh, happening with the drought and and warming? 
uh, predicting that we should invest more in a particular energy source that would uh, be most beneficial to the environment? Well, I think uh, the most uh, critical thing is to get out of fossil fuel as quickly as possible. Fossil fuel is the cause of the primary cause of global warming. Um, it is um, going to continue for every piece of coal or drop of oil or gas uh, that we, you know, uh, burn. It's putting CO2 up into the atmosphere. We've got to get out of fossil fuels as fast as we can. Um, Nuclear is an interesting thing. Um, the problem with nuclear is it's so darn expensive. One of the benefits of renewable clean energy, wind and solar, is that it's really uh, inexpensive now, certainly relative to nuclear and coal, and it's getting cheaper than natural gas even um, as we speak in sun and the solar in Arizona is cheaper than natural gas, just as wind is cheaper in, in Michigan. Um, so uh, as the price of those things plummet and we get stor storage from batteries and other sources, we should be able to get off of uh, fossil fuels pretty darn, darn quickly, and we shouldn't need nuclear. Now, there are a lot of nuclear power plants. There's a lot of carbon dioxide put in the atmosphere during the production or the construction of nuclear power plants. Um, so that's a problem, but once they're built, they do produce very low carbon energy. And so I'm a big fan of keeping those around as long as we can. But if you look at the news just today, Pennsylvania has, has declined to bail out Three Mile Island, and they're going to have to shut that one down. And that just is a reflection not of further safety issues, but the fact that to maintain safe nuclear costs a lot of money. And it's way more expensive than fossil fuel, i.e. natural gas, and even more expensive than uh, renewable energy. So the problem with nuclear, um, the big problem is it's just gonna be too expensive. Um, no one really thinks we're gonna see a resurgence in nuclear energy. Uh, of course, people write op-eds for the Wall Street Journal like to say we're gonna do that, but it's just, it's too darn expensive. We want a world where energy gets cheaper, not more expensive, and we can have that and solve climate change too, simply by going to renewable energy and storage. Okay, well that's gonna to have to be it for today. Uh, we're out of time, but we wanna thank everybody uh, for coming and participating and asking questions today. Uh, we had a great discussion. Thank you, Peck, uh, for a wonderful presentation and for stimulating all the discussions that came afterwards. Uh, thank you. Thanks to, uh, also to our, our cooperative partners, uh, AGI uh, and, uh, and AGU in this case, and. Uh, have, have a great, uh, great rest of the day, whatever takes on your end. Everybody, bye-bye.